Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode. We are so excited today, you guys. I know we say that a lot, but this time we really We're mean it. Excited, We're always excited, but, but this is a good one. Today's a big show. We today on Holy and Human are having a transformative conversation with New York Times bestselling author of Seed of the Soul, Gary Zukov, and his wife and spiritual partner, Linda Francis. That book has had a major influence on our lives. I mean, we talk about it in the podcast a little bit, how it's affected us so He's deeply. the first person to talk about multisensory awareness in a way that really penetrated the collective and really had people who normally wouldn't go in into the world of the woo-woo could really understand what he was talking about because of his beautiful articulation and specific content of how he talks about it. Together, they've authored over 10 different books, which have sold millions of copies and are published in 30 languages. Their work has radically evolved the understanding of soul and healing. Your soul is that aspect of you, that part of you that existed before you were born and that will continue to exist after your personality dies. So listen today as they share their intimate stories from their own personal journeys that have formed the foundation of their own inner knowing and will help you find your own. Get ready for this empowering and personal conversation with two of our most favorite authors. And we wanted to let you know that today, our book, Holy Love, The Essential Guide to Soul-Fulfilling Relationships, is available for pre-order. We are so excited. We've waited a long time for this. It's coming. You can order it anywhere online, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, uh, Book Depository if you're overseas in the UK. Or if you want to support your local bookstore, they're showing up pretty much uh, everywhere I've checked. So uh, check that out. But after you order it, make sure you head on over to our website, holyandhuman.com. It'll walk you through how to enter your receipt number so that you get free tickets to our online VIP event to celebrate Sunday, February 13th, 2022, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific. We will have guided soul journey meditations, profound inquiries, and a live Q&A. Whether you are single or with a partner, come join us for this love event where we will access how the essence of who we are as souls is love and how to meet ourselves and each other from that place of healing. But for now, relax and enjoy our interview with Linda Francis and Gary Zukov. Well, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. And um, I mean, it's just wild to be sitting here with you because you've both been such big figures for us for years. I was trying to remember when See the Soul first came out because I read that years ago. Do you know what year that came out? Was that 1889. Wow. Oh my gosh. I mean, it was so influential in my life. My path was kind of trying to merge where spirituality and psychology either meet or do not meet. And so Mm -hmm. I went to a Jungian program. And when I was at Pacifica, I don't know if you know that school in uh, Mm -hmm. Santa Barbara. And when Mm -hmm. I was there, I had an out of body experience that changed my life while I was on the campus and Mm -hmm. met, met my soul and her kind of information for me was you think you know me but you have (laughs) an idea of who you think I am and you're not actually in direct feeling and communication with me so Mm -hmm. um so our book and our work is 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 similar and that it's kind of like do you actually are you communicating directly with your soul or is it more of a concept and idea and so I was rereading a lot of your material for today. And I was thinking, wow, how much your work has really permeated and helped me and and the ability to kind of draw connections because you put into words so clearly what I had to also kind of find out internally, but it's so helpful to have someone who can speak it to, to know Mm -hmm. it's true and real and you're not alone and crazy. (laughs) (laughs) So my first question is, uh, I just reading Gary, I love the story about how at your grandma's funeral, you remember you were in high school and you felt her holding your hand. It was, uh, uh, it was a little later than that. I was in college and I came back for her funeral and 
we used to, I used to stop in Kansas City on my way back from Harvard uh, on the holidays, and I would spend that night with my grandmother, and we'd talk about the family and just enjoy being with it, with each other. And she would take me to a restaurant in this large building that she was living in, and afterwards we'd walk around the lobby when there were always a lot of people there, and she'd introduce me to them all, and <laughs> and then she'd say, "You remember Mrs. and you remember Mr." And I would shake my hand, my head, and if I didn't, or if I said no, she would jerk down on my hand, which we we were holding hands, and she'd say, "Shh," mm -hmm. like that. She would shush me if I didn't. <laughs> if I, remember if I, if I didn't friends. remember yeah <laughs> so when I was at her funeral uh, the rabbi was talking to the guest in front of him and the family was in the alcove to his right and in the archway of the alcove mounted close to the ceiling was a closed circuit monitor and in those days that was a novelty very few people had seen closed circuit television and it made me laugh and as soon as I laughed, my grandmother jerked down on my hand and said, Shh. she shushed me again mm -hmm. so that she could hear and enjoy her funeral. Wow. I loved I loved hearing that story because obviously you've had a long history of your multisensory consciousness. And um, it was nice to hear that little tidbit because as you're reading your words, they're so specific and articulate and spoken as somebody who knows. And then I, as a reader, sometimes have the question of how does he know this? How do, where is the place in him that he is, you know, and it's kind of like, I don't know if you ever heard Carl Jung's, I don't believe I know uh, statement. And so one of my questions for you, and I know it's kind of a weird question and how to ask it, but how do you know, both for both of you, how do you, and I, the, the reason I brought up the grandma story is because I think that's one way you might know is right. You've had many years of experiencing through your multisensory mm -hmm. awareness. Sometimes it doesn't work like that. There are many people now who are multisensory mm -hmm. and not, uh, who are not multisensory, but have intermittent multisensory experiences. And I was such a person then. I had the experience as I described it. I knew enough not to tell my parents because they'd think I was hallucinating with grief and loss. Uh, but I didn't recognize it for what it was. It was just something that happened. Grandma was there and she told me to be quiet at her funeral. Hmm. It wasn't until years later that I could recognize that. I was writing my first book on quantum, it was on quantum physics. And I had oh, a, a wonderful experience of writing chapters, writing outlines and throwing them away because the energy would always go in a different direction. And after half a year, I had six chapters written, and they all fit together very well. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how that could happen since I threw away the outlines. Mm -hmm. And that's when I first became aware of the fact that I was not writing this book alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, that it's impossible to be alone. And that was my first uh, experience of non-physical reality with the knowledge that that's what I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that knowledge when I was hearing Grandma Libby at, at her mm -hmm. funeral. Yeah. And it was a multi-sensory experience. But following that encounter, I knew uh, that that was non-physical reality. And, uh, and not only that, I loved it. I decided <laughs> I was going to write my, I was going to live my life the way this book was being written, which was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, spontaneously, uh, intelligently, and joyfully. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That was the beginning of my explorations of non-physical reality. I love that phrasing you use, kind of intermittent uh, multisensory experiences, because I think about all the people that have had multisensory experiences but have not integrated it. I uh, have not come to that conclusion of recognizing it as truth. So it can be very confusing being a multisensory person, but not, like you said, Gary, having the parent uh, parental system to support that or having people that recognize what's happening to you. Do you have any advice for people that are waking up, but they feel like they are not validated in their truth? It, it didn't exactly um, emerge in my experience that way, 
Mm -hmm. I had the experience with my grandmother. Uh, it didn't seem out of the ordinary to me at all. It didn't seem much less frightening. Mm -hmm. It was just grandma telling me to be quiet at her funeral. <laughs> yeah, and and I so love I didn't. That. But so and it didn't it didn't confuse me. But I think that a lot of people are, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 you're exactly right because they might think that uh, they're crazy because mm -hmm. they're seeing things or experiencing mm -hmm. things, and others don't understand, and they don't understand what they're experiencing. Exactly. So we, yeah. part of what we enjoy doing is just, uh, let, let, as you do, I think, validating people's experience. But I was never confused about it, so I didn't need that validated. Yeah. When, when, I, when I met the or encountered that assistance I had. It was experiential. It wasn't conceptual. Um, I knew, and I knew, and just the way you know that you're talking with us now. Yeah. yeah. I love that so much. Go ahead, Linda. Well, as I say, when Gary and I met, um, it was a few years after I had read The Seed of the Soul. And um, I knew I was being connected, I could say in a multi-sensory way. From, I knew the universe was connecting me with Gary. I, I just knew it. Um, but I also had many fearful parts of my personality that became active because of that knowing about something and then, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I don't feel equal to this person. I feel inferior. Um, I think he's superior to me. He's written these amazing books and all of that. And so I had a lot of um, work for myself and I knew that's what what I was being offered an opportunity mm. to grow to really learn about myself yeah uh, to accept you know coming together with Gary and then and then what we all we wanted to do as we as we developed our spiritual partnership uh, I'll say that's a partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth that's what, and so the whole purpose of our relationship is to grow spiritually and so as we did that we wanted to share everything we were learning and that's what we've been doing um, mm -hmm. Since we met, which was almost thirty years, about thirty years ago, wow. beautiful. We're so glad you did. Can you find that part from the book? What yeah. I what I loved hearing in an interview that you guys did was upon your meeting that Gary recognized some resistance that was inside of him <laughs> regarding the meeting, and we had that big time with us too. And mm -hmm. um, and to really, what I loved Gary also in the interview was how you articulated. I think Linda, you were telling the story about how he communicated to you, like, I'm noticing this resistance and I'm curious to discover what that is and how high of an EQ and emotional quotient that is to be able to identify the feeling, communicate the feeling, having the courage to be along for the ride of what, what that is. Um, and yeah, Adam one of my out. favorites of your guys is heart of the soul. Uh, we <laughs> love, we love the, the depth of relationship work. He here. brought this up to me the other day um, and we thought it was so interesting. And one of the things I wanted to ask you guys about is in the beginning of the book, you talk about your differences a little bit. Uh, and Gary, you talk about how you were born with this gift, which I absolutely agree with, uh, the ability to articulate, um, concisely very big concepts uh, and very complicated truths in a way that people can digest and, and resonate with. Uh, and one of your strengths, Linda, in the book, it says is uh, being conscious of your emotions and being comfortable with your emotional self. So this book really felt like it was a meeting point between you two uh, about figuring out how to articulate the spiritual truths in the emotional soup and complexities of being human. So I would just love to hear what your experience over the years has been with that difference and how you guys have uh, grown through it. Well, I, I can say that um, I am have such gratitude for the way that Gary can articulate things. And I feel like us too. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because yes, of course. And because I I can see that in him. Um, I know that it's part of me too. You know, mm -hmm. it's not that it's not that I don't have that, but it's not developed in me like it is in Gary. And so I I keep learning more about how to articulate um, more clearly all the time. That's that's one of the things that I love to do. But more importantly, the thing that that I know is 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 also a gift of mine, is to be able to create experiential 
um, ways for people to understand what the words are, what Gary's saying. So that's why throughout that book, as you saw, there are many exercises, many ways of people understanding what the concepts of becoming emotionally aware are, what that really means. Uh, yeah. Because if you if you can't experience, experience it, at least for me, I learn that way. I learn, really learn at depth through experiencing something, um, not just in my head. Absolutely. That. that experiential piece, I think is so important. It's so easy to read spiritual concepts and to stay mm -hmm. in your head. And I know mm -hmm. in the book, uh, Gary, you mentioned, I, I believe it was your uncle who said the longest journey you'll take is from your head to your heart. Yes, our adopted yeah. Sioux uncle. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And that that's right exactly. And um, he adopted I, us. Yeah, he yeah. adopted <laughs> us. Sounds like yeah. a good person to have in your life. And there's uh, at, with yeah, with the experiential piece, I really feel like that's where wisdom comes in. Where yeah. spirit yeah, there's uh it it moves away from intellectual concept to integratable wisdom that you can mm -hmm. use in your life and and with your relationships. And that's why we love that you guys focus on intimacy so much, because there's one thing knowing the concepts and one thing really trying to truly be your authentic self with the person you love. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very much. And with everyone much. around you. And yeah. I, I agree with you, uh, Adam. Uh, and I think at least uh, completely it's experience is the key mm -hmm. and the heart of the soul, which you held up, uh, that's co-authored by Linda and me is a good example of that. I wrote the text between the exercises. Linda created all of those exercises. No, so what I've discovered in the years since that was published is that if someone just reads the text at the end of the book, mm. they know a lot about emotional awareness, <laughs> but they're not emotionally aware. Right. And that's that so interesting. The purpose of the book. Oh, yeah. We just finished writing a book together called Holy Love with, and it, the collaboration was so interesting for the relationship, you know, to go back and forth and to write, yes. kind of find that voice together. Um, because you guys are opening so many people, initiating them to this conscious understanding of themselves as multi-sensory beings, it, it, it brings up some questions sometimes as people start to kind of connect the dots, right? And some of those questions I hear from clients frequently are like, well, so if everything's happening for a reason for my soul, if things are orchestrated for my highest good and evolution, what does that mean about free will versus fate? And how is law of attraction a part of all of that? If what we focus on expands, and maybe that depends on how the personality is or isn't doing that, how, how does that all work together where there's an evolutionary destiny, where there's some part of the acorn moving into the oak tree naturally that's destined and then there's also is there is there free will when things are all happening for reasons well you've bundled a lot of things right there <laughs> big question i just open, thought i'd open up open it up take it any way you want <laughs> first first of all we want to say to you and and oh, yes. your listeners uh, we don't suggest that you take anything that we say as true just because we say it. Uh, if there's anything you resonate with that we say, then experiment with that. And if it produces something that you like, experiment some more. And if it doesn't, then let it go. Don't try to wear a shoe that pinches. That's a good and point. <laughs> I would suggest, yes, and I would suggest that you don't, that you do the same all the time. Don't take as so whatever someone says simply because they say it or because they have a television show or they've written a book or they, they have a pulpit and a congregation. Experiment with it. <coughs> Pardon me, yourself. Uh, become the authority in your life. That's creating authentic power. That's what it does. There is no such thing in my experience as destiny. The universe doesn't burden you with a destiny. There is potential. And then it's a matter of how much of that potential you will choose to bring into being. Right. Mm. And also in our experience, everything that happens is for your spiritual growth. And the purpose of every experience in the Earth School, which is that span of time between your birthday and your death, day, the day that your personality dies, your soul returns 
to non-physical reality, returns home. That is not determined. It's always a matter of uh, choice. Mm -hmm. And what you're choosing is an intention in each moment, no matter what you think your intention is, to get a better job, uh, to go to a new city, um, to buy a house or not, whatever it is, what is the intention underneath that? The intention to do things in the world, those are, you might call them out tensions, but your intention is the energy underneath that. An intention is a quality of consciousness that infuses your deed or your word. And if that consciousness, if that quality of consciousness is love, then that infuses your actions and your words. And if it's fear, that infuses your actions and your words. And you can distinguish between these. This is required for creating authentic power. It's one of the few things that is. You need commitment. You need courage. Uh, you need to dis you, you need the tools are emotional awareness and responsible choice and you can consult intuition yeah i love that definition i love the idea of thinking of it as a potential because in that way you are either aligning with your potential or leaning into it or not opposed to thinking of destiny as there's a future goal and am i going to reach that future goal or not and it also puts more of the emphasis on the present moment. So it's, are you choosing love or fear in this moment? Are you embodying your potential in this moment, but it's not based off external circumstances? Well said, exactly yeah. that. It's all about your intention. It's all about the present moment. There's no power outside of the present moment. And that's where, and the only where, that you can create authentic power mm. is in the present moment. And so, um, well, we're, we're really uh, quite in alignment on, on these things. Right. Yeah. Um, so I like this present moment. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a present moment. Right. Uh, uh, it's not, I wouldn't say this is a bad present moment or a good present moment. It is the present moment. Hmm. And anything beyond that is a judgment that we make. This hmm. is good this is bad these are good people to be with these are not good people to be with everything that happens in the earth school happens for your spiritual development in other words everything every experience that you encounter serves the purpose of bringing um, the consciousness of your soul into the awareness of your personality yeah I would love to hear some de the definitions of uh, soul and personality that you have come to understand. Of course. <laughs> um, your personality is a you with a little, little why, you might say, a little you. It's the one that came into being when you were born on your birthday, and it's the one that will die, uh, go back to ashes and dust, when your soul returns home to non-physical reality on your death day. That's your personality. It's your body. It's your mind. Um, to be in the earth school is to have a personality. Your soul is that aspect of you, that part of you that existed before you were born and that will continue to exist after your personality dies. And creating authentic power is the process. Aligning the part of you that is temporary, that is mortal. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem temporary while you're living it, <laughs> but it is. It comes and goes very quickly. It's aligning that part of who you are with the part of you that is immortal. Mm -hmm. As you align yourself with your soul, mm -hmm. you develop the ability to distinguish between love and fear inside yourself, not in others, inside yourself, and choose love all the time, no matter what's happening inside of you or outside of you. So what does choose love mean? It means choose the intention, an intention that comes from love. Uh, the parts of your personality 
that do not originate in love, we experience as anger, jealousy, resentment, competition, overwhelm, anxiety, uh, vengeance, the need for, superiority, entitlement, uh, inferiority, need to please, uh, obsessions, compulsions, addictions. Those are all experiences of fear. Yeah. And the parts of your personality that you experience as love are uh, gratitude, appreciation, caring, contentment, patience, awe of the universe. All of these experiences originate in love. When you act on them, you create constructive, healthy consequences. All of those other experiences originate in fear. Mm. They are painful to experience, and when you act on them, you create painful, destructive experiences. Mm. Now, learning how to do that, distinguish between those two, is the process of creating authentic power. It's the process of creating authentic power. Mm -hmm. It's not an event. Mm. The first time you recognize that you're in a frightened part of your personality, you're angry, for example, and you realize you're angry, in that moment you can recognize that you are in a part of your personality. You're not, that's not you. It's a part of your incarnation. And you have other parts, parts that are grateful and are appreciative and caring. And you can choose to reach for those parts while you're angry or jealous or competitive. And that is the moment of creating authentic power. That's when it happens. That's when the spiritual rubber meets the road. And the more you do this, the more the part of your personality that you're challenging loses its control over you, and you move beyond its control. And as you do, the more love can enter your awareness. Mm -hmm. I love how you said. put that. And I think in sessions and retreats, we're doing that similar thing of like where you're trying to hold the person in love so that they have the courage to stay with the feelings that are rising that might be really uncomfortable or, you know, where they want to maybe dissociate or spiritually bypass, leave the body and how to hang there with the feelings that are rising while also bringing in the intention or the kind of activating love to hold it at the same time. And I think that's almost what creates the tension of the opposites to kind of create that alchemical vessel that brings those kind of more unconscious personality parts into the ability to transform into the transcendent function as Jung would call it. Well, mm -hmm. that is the process of creating authentic power in our experience mm -hmm. is feeling a frightened part of your personality, having the ability to recognize it. Mm -hmm. And you can identify it somatically. Like Linda said, the, the uh, heart of the soul is a how to book concerning exactly that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then choosing love as well as you can in this context, the cause is an intention. It's your intention that creates consequences in the world. Not your words, not your deeds. You can have a smiling face and give money to a charity. But if you're doing it to make yourself feel better, that's an intention of fear. If you're doing it because you want to support people through the charity that they're supporting and you can't support directly, that's a gift of love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love that phrasing we uh, often talk about. Yeah, it's not about what you do, but how you do it. Uh, Linda, I would love to hear from you can about... Talk, can, I, can I add something? Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of saying it's not what you do, but how you do it, uh, you could say it's not what you do, but why you do it. That that comes back to the intention. this is the gift of articulation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and I think, you know, when I had my out-of-body experience, it was so interesting because my dad was a biochemist and I was always kind of mm -hmm. taught, you know, the minute you die, fade to black, worms me, there's nothing more. And so <laughs> the first thing I was like, well, I'm existing as consciousness. I'm seeing my physical body. And then it occurred to me, so what does that mean about eternity and who I am and does this end? Does this never end? And, you know, and having feelings about that. And, um, and what I realized as a spirit is like, you don't have a mouth and you don't have feet. So the way you communicate is telepathically through the power of intention, you feel the intention. That's our language. That's like what we understand. So when I came back into my body, I was feeling it awoken in me that, and it was disorienting for about a full year. I hid in my parents' basement, like, how do I mm -hmm. act like a human 
when the physical world story that they're saying, or I believe the narrative of the ego might be very different than what I'm feeling energetically. That's right. That's right. So you recognized um, something, whether you had a name for it or not, but you knew that that's a part of who you are and you experimented with it. That's really uh, becoming the authority in your own life is. is the end of creating authentic power. Also, love is the end of creating authentic power. That's when you where, say the end, what do you mean by that? The, where you wind up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you look at it as a journey, mm -hmm. that's, where you're, that's where you're going. Yeah. It's a, to it's become a, a master in your life. But it's a process that continues it, throughout our life. It is a process yeah. that continues. Yeah. 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 I love the knowingness and faith that you both speak of that because definitely... There's times with clients or ourselves that will feel like with all the disruption on the planet right now, you know, globally, politically and everything to it, it seems like when you speak of it, you kind of always will say this is like happening. Like we are turning into multisensory humans. The shift is occurring. This evolution is happening. And in some way, that's what I was talking about earlier with the destiny. It feels like you guys feel the destiny of that occurring, that that evolution will happen it's almost like the baby coming down the canal it's kind of like will it the put potential is there but will this baby be born alive or will it be a stillbirth sometimes i think people feel like that towards humanity i feel you're mixing a couple of things if, if i may I'll, yeah I'll i'd love to i'd love to hear mix a little bit <laughs> multi-sensory perception is uh, much what you've described it is happening and uh, it's not only coming down the birth canal, it's out. There's hundreds of millions of individuals who are multi-sensory. That's the new consciousness. And uh, within a few generations, all of us will be multi-sensory. Mm -hmm. However, authentic power is not a gift from the universe. Mm -hmm. It's not just happening. That's a potential. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you create authentic power or not is the choice. The choice to bring that potential into being in your life, to become a loving, connected, grounded, healthy, sane individual and conscious of it in the earth school. That is a choice. Every step along of the way, everything that stands between you and what you want to become are matters of choice. And that's the only thing. So, Very well phrased. Yeah. Beautiful. The multi-sensory perception is the gift, mm -hmm. and with it comes a new potential. Mm -hmm. The old understanding of power for five sensory humans was the ability to manipulate and control. And that's a big shift for all of us. That used to be good medicine. That used to be how we survived. But now it's poisonous. It prevents our evolution. The new understanding of power is the alignment of your personality with your soul. Five sensory perception and the understanding of power as external is the old consciousness that has no future. Multi-sensory perception as alignment of personality and soul is the new consciousness. Yeah. And we are in this time of overlap, in this time of transition, when we stand with one foot in the old consciousness and one in the new. And at every moment, we make a choice. So when you have an impulse uh, that comes from anger, are you going to express it? That's the old consciousness. That's trying to change someone. That's trying to change the world in order to make yourself feel better. And I'm, I'm thinking people experience that every day. And right now we're talking um, during near, in the holiday season of 2021. And people have been with their families or not with their families, or many things have happened. Some people weren't able to come to be with their families. Some people, um, there were there were just all kinds of things, but always families getting together, people getting together, but families getting together offers so much opportunity to really look at anything that's going on, that that's in you that um, isn't in alignment with your soul, Yeah, that comes up. So that instead of blaming a family member for something that, that they bring up in you, 
you begin to look at yourself and see what does that have to do with me because I'm the one who's reacting here. And so how can I change myself so that I don't have that distance that I'm feeling right now from whoever it is. And I feel like um, that that is uh, one of our, besides becoming multisensory, Gary's talking about authentic power is aligning your personality with your soul. Mm-hmm. And that's the part where we need to do our work, all of us on the planet, everyone that's a human. Yeah. And when you know when you know that, it's it's very exciting because when something comes up that is very painful, it maybe feels very painful in your body, you know, oh, this is for me to look at. This is something for me. I get to learn about myself. I, I told you um, that when I met Gary, one of the things that came up for me was I felt inferior. And it, it was really helpful for me to understand that. I knew it. I just knew it. And intuitively, I knew, oh, this is why I'm having all this pain. Um, but I began the process of shifting that in me instead of feeling like he was superior and I there's no way I could be with someone who's written these books that are so important to me. I didn't have to I didn't have to go that way. I could decide because I knew because I'd read the seat of a yeah. soul that I wanted to create authentic power mm-hmm. and I'd been actually working on that. In fact, I know you talked about destiny. I know I would not have met Gary had I not been working on myself. Hmm. Because I, I knew very clearly that there were choices that I made and things that happened and ways that I looked at myself. And I began changing my relationships with men after I read The Seed of a Soul. And I could see that I was trying to please. I, I was you know, wanting to have someone make me complete. Mm. And I realized that that was like the opposite of creating authentic power. Mm. And so I, I was in a relationship that I got to feel very clearly that... Um, I was trying, trying to uh, have someone, I was, I was needing someone to fulfill me. I was, mm-hmm. I needed that. It didn't really have anything to do with love. It seemed like love to me. That's all I really understood about love. Yeah. But when something happened where I found out that he was engaged to marry someone else at the same time I was in a relationship with him, it was oh, so... Wow. It was so amazing because I was able to feel the depth of that pain, Mm. that it was so painful, but it was what happened was I let myself feel Mm. the painful feelings, but I knew it had something to do with me. Somehow I I knew that I was being given this grace to know this has to do with me, not him. Mm. And so I looked at what he was bringing up in me and I began to shift that in me and see oh this is me it's not him yeah he's doing whatever he's doing because of that i knew i i knew that i could actually have a healthy relationship for the first time (laughs) um i don't think i don't i don't think of destiny i think more of because of the choices i made Mm. there were certain things that could happen Mm -hmm. that wouldn't have if i had not made some of the choices i made (laughs) there's no way i would have met gary Mm-hmm. Yeah. We would have been not interested in each other at all. Yeah, mm-hmm. I guess that. Would have, I, would have, I wouldn't have been in a place where I could have even understood um, that there was, I, I couldn't have. But yeah. because, my, because I already knew my spiritual growth was so important to me, mm-hmm. I didn't quite know what to do. But mm-hmm. I knew I wanted to grow. I knew I wanted to learn about myself. That was mm-hmm. what was important. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and that began to shift me. And, and so that the thing, the people I was meeting, the things that were happening, the intuitions that mm. I, the intuition that I was having, because I, I knew I was being connected. Mm-hmm. That, that was, everything began to change. Everything mm. as I, as I uh, opened myself and I said, I want to align my personality with my soul. Mm. I, I want to create with love more and more often. Yeah. And that's, and I still, that's still why I'm here. Mm. Yeah. I know that's why I'm here. The way you guys are yeah. describing it, uh, to me, it's it's like almost like humanity is given this the gift of the tool of multisensory awareness, yes. and then it's yes. our choice of and our responsibility of if how we use that tool. That's right. Do we use it to gain external power over others or to manipulate others, or do we use it to become more in touch with ourselves? There can also be, I think, Linda, what you were kind of describing 
And I very much relate to this experience <laughs> of when you gain that e extra awareness, that self-awareness, it's almost like in that moment, you become aware of everything you've mm. been holding in the past, all the fear and all the doubt and all the things that have blocked us. And so it can be really humbling. Like I've definitely had that experience where I feel like I can feel my higher self, my soul self. And then I'm looking at my lower self and I'm like, oh, wow, there's so many places I've been blind or missing the point. Or so it's, it's, it's this experience of feeling my most holy self at the same time as feeling my most sort of messy human self and trying to bring that love together. Uh, I'd love to hear. I think Gary has some articulation uh, yeah. here. <laughs> Any thoughts about that? I would like, oh, here's another multi-sensory experience. My mother, um, after a series, a, a history of heart complications, uh, was finally at the end of her, the life of her personality. And Linda and I could not go to be with her because we had the flu. And uh, she lived not in- Not COVID, it was a long time ago. Oh, yeah. long before that, yeah, because uh, we, she lived in the Midwest. And uh, so we were talking with my sister and she said, we think that this is the time to stop her um, life support system, which was just IV tubes feeding her and keeping her, keeping her alive. And so um, we, we, we trusted my sister's judgment, which I think was good, and because we couldn't be there and said, well, we agree. And <laughs> afterwards, Linda and I were in our living room and we were saying, uh, I, I was sort of in a, a daydream, a, a reverie. And in it, I was talking to my mother and uh, she had to move from this little town where she lived 50 years and into another city to be closer to her daughter and into an assisted living center, which she didn't like never liked at all and she was there for about two or three years and i was saying to her in this reverie mom i'm i'm sorry things got so messy at the end toward the end and then i heard this voice and it was not a voice it was my mother's voice <laughs> and she said things are always messy honey <laughs> spoken just like what she was uh, a, a little mo a mom from the midwest <laughs> so um, when you're in a place where you think that there's a difference between your holy life and, well, th this is your podcast. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> holy and human. It's, it's yep. the hypothesis, right? Or yeah. the yes. thesis. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a good one because it's not holy or human. It's right. holy and human. Exactly. And mm -hmm. that's the important connector. And, and so when you're thinking of something that you've done wrong or haven't done well, or you're embarrassed or humiliated, like I get some, I get when I'm, in a, in a frightened part of my personality. That's a time to be gentle with yourself. Oh, yes. That's a time to have compassion for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's important to do because if you don't have compassion for yourself, you won't have compassion for anyone else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most people are striving to become compassionate people or the most many people that we would know. And they want to do that, but they won't accomplish that until they become compassionate with themselves. Mm -hmm. And so when uh, you look at yourself as someone in the earth school and you look at where you came from, where you were born, your parents, the things that you encountered along the way to now, to your experiences of now, and you can have compassion with yourself. You were doing the, you all, you're always doing the best you can. And then you can start to see other people the same way. You can see that their lives are as complex and labyrinthine and challenging and filled with potential as your own. And then instead of judging them, you can recognize they're frightened perhaps. They're, 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 if they're acting rudely or competitively, they're in a frightened part of their personality. They are hurting, fear yeah. hurts physically. Yeah. And then your compassion arises naturally. It's beautiful. Because, I, I love yeah. that you say in the book, um, the appropriate response to evil is presence. Cause I feel like you're saying that a little bit in this way too, of like, if we have anywhere that's separated or in fear, the appropriate response is compassion and presence and expanding. Yes. The, the, the evil is not a thing. It's an absence. It's an absence of love. Mm. And 
in that absence itself can stumble in the darkness. Yeah. But how can you um, interact? What can you do about an absence? Can you um, lock it up? Can you uh, ostracize it? Can you exile it? Can you handcuff it? Can you kill it? Can you execute it? No. There's only one remedy for an, an absence, and that is a presence. That, I believe, is what you're referring to, at least. In the, yeah. the Earth School is the domain of time and space and matter and duality. The fundamental duality in the Earth School is love and fear. The opposite of love is not hatred. Mm -hmm. It's fear. Yeah. Where That's... there is love, there is not fear. Where there is fear, there is not love. And as you learn to choose love over fear consciously, through the information that your emotions are giving you, through the application of your volition, then you begin to experience all of these things. And that's the gift. Every emotional experience you have is a gift of love. Um, in our events, especially early events, people would say, well, where's the love in this? Why are we always talking about fright and parts of, it, of the personality? Mm -hmm. The love is everywhere. Mm. You were created. Your incarnation was a movement of love. Every experience that you encounter is a gift of love. Every experience we encounter in the Earth School has a purpose, and that purpose is to bring the consciousness of your soul into the awareness of your personality. Many of those experiences are experiences that the personality does not want. Cancer, divorce, the death of a child, the failure of a business. Yet, they all serve the same purpose. The love is everywhere. This universe is a universe of love, of consciousness, of life. It's not a universe as five century physics describes it. Nothing is as five sensory perception or understanding describes it. As you become multi-sensory, you begin to see it in more depth and richness. It's like uh, you're watching a black and white movie and as you're watching it, it's becoming color. It's something like that. Yeah. And you see more meaning and purpose and clarity. Mm and context everywhere. You see more goodness everywhere. And where you don't see it, you recognize that perception of lack of goodness is a perception of a frightened part of your personality. Right. Every perception reveals the structure of the perceiver. Hmm. What is your structure? Your reactions or responses show you moment by moment. Your reactions, which means your you unconsciously act again in fear as you have in the past, again creating painful consequences, or you respond differently than you have in the past. You step back, challenge a frightened part of your personality rather than someone in the world you think is causing pain in you. You change yourself and you change, instead. And yeah. you change yourself instead, as Linda just yeah. said. Yeah. Well, That's wonderful. creating authentic. And what a gift of all your books and your retreats and that people have access to this wisdom that thank goodness you wrote it down and are communicating it to the world so that people can access it. Um, I encourage everyone listening to go get all the books, go check out the website. We'll put links of how to go find out about this next year's offerings that you guys are doing so wonderfully that are coming up. I think the last question I'll end on, cause there's like probably a thousand questions we could ask you, but we, we know we've for a very long time been with talking you guys. for a while, <laughs> but um, the final question I'll ask, because I hear this over and over from clients and how would you answer when someone says this idea of, you know, okay, so the soul is in this kind of perfected state or whatever we want to call it of love and understanding. And then the personality is here in the physical and time and space. Um, if the soul is kind of evolved or perfect, why do we 
need to incarnate to have these life experiences in order to grow or evolve? Is it evolving the soul? I have clients when I have a client, you know, recently whose husband died in COVID and um, she really feels, she understands this idea of the personality and the soul. And she really kind of keeps going to this under, she thinks that it's not that we wanted to incarnate, but more of a punishment, the karmic wheel, we can't get off. And it's more of kind of like the Gnostic arc nons kind of interpretation of um, being punished to be here. So, and I know a lot of that has to do with, you know, the state of what she's experiencing somatically in her body and her narrative of like what her ego's interpretation of what's happening. But so I guess my question is <laughs> after saying all that is when you zoom out, what, what do you feel is, like, I guess the point, right, is the point to, in some ways, I think sometimes it's to become a spiritual warrior consciously, to become conscious of doing all these practices over and over so that we can be really conscious of how we are love. <laughs> I know it's a big one, so take it any way you want. Yes, but first, uh, there's nothing in the universe that is perfected, mm. finished, evolving. Everything in the universe evolves toward greater awareness and freedom, including souls. Um, what you're talking about uh, now are belief systems. And you need to decide what belief system you're going to experiment with. I suggest, and we don't give many suggestions, but I suggest that you experiment with belief systems that don't contain fear. The belief system that the universe is alive, wise, and compassionate, that everything that occurs in your life is an experience that serves your spiritual development is one of those kinds of belief systems. It reminds me of, uh, too, when uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, someone once asked a Tibetan Lama, said, why are you so optimistic? You know, you've, you've lost everything. Mm. Uh, your culture is gone. The mm. temples are gone. The libraries are gone. Mm. Your culture has been forced to be, to live as a, as a guest in a neighboring country. And the Lama said, it makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And now, that reminds me too, we just met a new friend who's one of the owner, one of the creators of a t-shirt company called Life is Good. Mm -hmm. So we're talking to him about why is that? <laughs> How did that happen? Mm -hmm. And he sent us a book that he and his brother wrote and it has a simple premise on the first one or two pages. It says, life is not perfect. Life is not easy. Life is good. <laughs> so I, I suggest that. that you experiment with a belief system that fulfills you and it can be a very practical tool William James whom I mentioned earlier was at one time obsessed with these intellectual queries which lead nowhere by the way as we become multi-sensory <laughs> yep. linear logic of the intellect is being replaced by a higher order logic and understanding of the heart but William James was pondering again and again the question, do I have free will? Or is everything I'm experiencing destined? Is my pondering of free will already destined? Or is it a real challenge to destiny? And on and on and on. And at last, he freed himself of that torment. He simply said to himself, I, free will exists. And my first act of free will is to believe in free will. Yeah. I love that. So share these things with your clients. And also, I appreciate very much uh, you're sharing these things with me and with Linda. We can learn a lot from you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in the middle areas of your incarnation, of your life in the earth school. Mm -hmm. We are at the end of ours. You have more ability to communicate with people who are also at them in the middle areas right. of their life, of their personalities, journey, 
than you have, for example, to communicate with people who are at the end of theirs. We have a lot of ability to do that. So yeah. as, as you see things that we do, as you go to our website, if you come to any of our events, and I love those events now because before people had to have the time and the money to yeah. take a leave from work or they're not working and then to pay for a plane ticket and then a hotel room and then restaurants. Now we can provide all of that in your house. I always feel like there's no better investment when people say, why should I do the soul work? I always feel like, well, at the end of all this, you're going to go back and assess from the left. Like, we'll see how, how much we were aligned or not aligned. And that's to me what it's all about. It's like all our success and happiness is from that Assess, assessment of it where we aligned or not so what else is there to do now <laughs> that's, that's, right. yes. that's said exactly. the main thing we're doing yeah, yeah. Well, so well, let's keep in touch wonderful well have have yeah. a wonderful rest of your day thank and you yeah. so much thank so you much love to you both giving us the time yeah thank you we're and eternally you grateful yeah. Bye now. Bye. Take, care. take care for more on Gary and Linda's work, head over to seatofthesoul.com and you can sign up for their new offering, which is the first time they are doing the Journey to the Soul as a year-long program, which is available to anyone online. You can do it from the comfort of your home. It's four amazing live interactive retreats. You can choose one or you can do the whole thing for the same price. It's a great deal. And to get a download and transmission from these two is truly an incredible opportunity.